Good afternoon, everyone. I'm putting my phone down here. How are you guys on this lovely Tuesday afternoon? It's quite cool here in Southern California, and I hope you're experiencing a safe time wherever you are across the globe. How come you don't do donuts in any of your cars? Because I'm a responsible driver. I don't know how that is a performance attribute. Um, I'm an engineer, and I like doing performance things to my car. So donuts is not one of them. As a matter of fact, the only person who's ever done donuts in my car was the guy from DDE who did it in the blue Porsche. Way in the corner, I'm pointing to right there. But I've never done that. It's just not, um, it doesn't add to my performance appetite, <laughs> if that makes sense, or extinguishing that performance appetite, you know? Speaking of boost, I hope you guys love that meme that I put up today um, around the <laughs> boost, adding boost to NA. Um, the passenger's opinion likes the 935, which is a factory 935 right there with twin turbos hanging out much larger than the factory KKKs that are on there. These are now twin 57 millimeter billets from Terminetics. And I really love infusing modern technology in older cars, whether it's the beauty of an older factory 935 or Kremer K3 with either the uh, advanced turbochargers and CAN bus, communication, all that fun stuff and that, or the vacation of that one. They're both fun cars and different in their own right, and they bring a lot to the table, you know? Stunner Red is asking, bring anything back to Jay Leno? Yes, so this is supposed to go to Jay Leno the Thursday before California shut down. We shut down on a Monday and that was it. So once this uh, lifts up, Jay is slated to drive both of these 935s and give a good comparison between petrol and electric. And I look forward to his insight because Jay keeps it real. So we'll see what happens, you know? Do you participate in legal drag racing against other competitors? Yes, um, I did for many, many years. But as I started my business, um, as Kevin, who's here can attest to, it got very challenging to be able to take care of customers while running a successful race team, so it was very difficult. So I chose and opted to take care of my customers first. And speaking of customers, that's why I want to talk to you guys about something when it comes to about uh, um, turbocharging. Like who's asking is asking about uh, uh, LS. LSs are not 12 to 1 compression. So when I was doing that meme, I was talking about a lot of people who like to take, you know, 11 and a half to 1, 12 to 1 natural aspirated setups that are inline fours and putting a ton of boost to it. And you know, I've done it too. We've had eight PSI, 10 PSI on decent sized turbos. I'm talking about 54 to 61 millimeter turbos. But when we start pushing it, things start going. But what I really want to talk about is the design parameters around um, exhaust manifolds. And something that I've been seeing that's almost an epidemic as I see cars come to my facility here, which is scary. And what is that? It's the inappropriate use of placement of a wastegate. Now, a wastegate on a turbo, as it implies, is like looking at this exhaust manifold, and you have the exhaust gases going into the piping, right, to help spool the turbo by turning the turbine, which is directly cogged to the compressor, and that pushing into the induction. Now, the only thing that prevents your turbo from overspinning, over boosting, and grenading your engine is by using some kind of boost control via a wastegate. And what the wastegate does, as the name implies, it's a gate that wastes excess gases, in this case exhaust, to prevent the turbo from spooling any further. So ideally, you want to get a collective of all these gases, waste it, and keep your turbo spinning at a certain rate so you only maintain a certain amount of boost. And as boost increased demands are there, the waste gate closes down, allows the boost degree to, to go up. And you want to do that controllably. Now here's the problem that I'm seeing out there, guys. And Kevin, you would love this as well. I see you asking about the inside in the wagon. Placement. Ideally, you want to waste all the gases at the same time. But look at this manifold. This is a customer's manifold where the wastegate is only on number three cylinder. So what does that mean? When you open up the wastegate to waste out the gases from the cylinder, only this cylinder will waste. Look at that. Only that cylinder. The other three cylinders would keep spooling the turbo, and what that does is it causes creep. And what is boost creep? It's where it has an uncontrollable amount of excess boost. Let's say that you have a three pound spring, and you want your vehicle to get to an RPM, go to three PSI and stay there because you're wasting all the gases to keep you there. And guess what? If you don't design your manifold properly, you can have a three pound spring in here, like I think this one car had a seven pound spring, and it shoots up to 16 PSI because the other manifold runners are still spooling the turbo. And you're right, 
um, you can't really get it, um, regulate it all, as Lance Kane is so eloquently put. Um, so that being said, it's it's really yeah. You say it's a it's, uh, sort of places like Antilag, but safer. No, it's it's really not. It's really the bad thing about tuning is um, you can't find really anomalies or bad things when tuning a car with high boost out the gate. You need to be able to gradually have a car at a decent amount of boost, make sure everything is safe, and gradually increase the boost. And if you have a customer or client or a user enthusiast who wants to enjoy your vehicle well, um, your setup may not want 20, 30 PSI in first gear. You may want to be able to do boost per gear or boost per speed, you know? Thank you so much for the kind words. Camera Steve LA says it's the best explanation I've heard for a wastegate. But in this case, this is a horrible bad design. And I don't know what's going on in the marketplace because I'm seeing more and more cars like this. I have actually three cars here with manifolds from other shops that look like this. So very nice welding. This is scheduled temp piping, um, good penetration with the welds. This looks like it will last, but this is not rooted in engineering at all. You should not waste one cylinder. Um, the only way to make this right is to put pipes on each cylinder and then put wastegates on each cylinder. But that adds complexity and cost, right? Or better yet, to, which this engine had a lot of space. This is on a B series, there's a lot of space. Remove this, extend this slightly, and then after the merge happens, waste from there. So all four cylinders can have a case of wasting and being very efficient. Also, there's another challenge with this. Guess what, with this being wasted, it now has a different differential in terms of um, fuel ratio versus the other ones. So you're wasting one cylinder and the fuel ratio capabilities are different in this cylinder versus the others. It's just a no-no, it's just, it's just bad. Um, so kudos to the fabricators out there that have great jobs but um, in doing, you know, fabricating like this, but it's very poor engineering. This is not a good engineered piece at all. This is actually quite, quite paltry, it's very bad. So guys, um, as you are out there buying exhaust manifolds and, and now you know a little bit more and you look at your manifolds, if you see something where the wastegate is only pulling from one cylinder or from only two cylinders or just from these two cylinders, um, buy from somewhere else. <laughs> or if you're working with your fabricator and you want him to do something good, please by all means, my pleasure indeed, it's not, it's not got Josh, appreciate that. Um, Make sure your manifold, a well done one, is wasting from post to collector. And that would be good, you know? So just wanted to share that with you. A little insight based upon what I experienced. And like I said, it's an epidemic. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of this recently. Um, I did it before. It's almost like some people are copying everyone else or no one's really thinking about the design as they're building these things. But it's bad for the customer, it's bad for the industry. It's just not good at all. And we're seeing a lot of um, boost creep that's not good for clients. It's just not good. And you can use the most high efficient, most high flowing turbo smart wastegate. It just won't make up for a poor exhaust manifold design, you know? Um, on a front engine turbo car, is it best to have a front exhaust on exhaust that dumps out the side or hood? Um, here are my thoughts on that. Two things. It looks really cool to have it come out the side. It looks really cool to have it on the, on the, under the hood. And it seems to be quite fashionable to do that nowadays. But um, I tried that once and I noticed two things. You get a lot of exhaust gases in the compartment with you, which is not good for you to breathe um, contaminants like that. It's not good to, for you to breathe any elements of combustion. Secondly, you know air has mass, a lot of mass. And what does that mean by that? As you are driving down the drag strip, even though you have a lot of velocity coming out of your exhaust system, air that's rushing across your hood and across side of your car does have mass. And that could impede to some extent your exhaust gas is evacuating. So what do I do with my turbo systems? I tend to like to evacuate them in an area where the pressure differential exists. In other words, an air slight vacuum, like under the car or behind the car, a place where your vehicle as a motion device can help excavate exhaust gases away from the car, which is what you want, right? So that being said, it looks really cool. Especially when you're shooting flames come out the hood or the side, it looks really cool, sounds great. But from an engineering perspective, um, I don't feel it's the best design. And I'd rather go undercarriage or rear the vehicle to help me ex excavate exhaust gases, which is much better for, for poor performance. So I hope that helps, you know? Any more news on AM EV controller? See that they have prices on the website by now, but isn't it actually clear what it can and can do? Great question. So there are two VCUs that are gonna be launched for Volt um, from AEM on the EV side. 
One will allow the capability of controlling one motor. It's a smaller device and it has the capability of doing everything from fail safe to launch control to being able to send data via CAN to your BMS and read that and allow you to regen when appropriate, allow you to discharge when appropriate, put in discharge limits, all that fun stuff. The larger VDU will allow you to control up to four motors. So if you have four AC motors in series, if you have a motor on each wheel and you want to do front wheel drive burnouts, rear wheel drive burnouts, you want to crab walk the car, you want to vector, the AM larger VDU will allow you to do that. Now the cool thing is that they're going to have a, a quite a few slew of items um, that will talk to each other. You will have, instead of a screen, you have these can based buttons that you can use to initiate starting, re reverse, neutral, and drive. You can even initiate touch control or drive uh, or launch control with that. It gives you the capability of using an analog input as well to be able to do that. So if you want to use a shifter like what I've done with this, you can use the analog input with a 12 volt on ground or low side ground to initiate those gears. And above and beyond that, it gives you the capability, if you so desire, to control mechanical devices that are analog, like your old tachometer, or vehicle temperatures, or state of charge devices. So that's the deal. You should see or have the capability of downloading the software and having fun with stuff in the next month or so. Those twin turbos in the back have me hypnotized. Your work is amazing, says PD Buns. Thank you so much. It's a team effort. Marvin really got to town on this one. So um, this, you know, none of my cars are just me. Guys, without my team, I'm nothing. I'm being completely honest with you. I mean, from Marvin to Sam to Miggy to Hedy to Lindsay to Albert, I mean, to even Fabe is helping out nowadays, to Durant, to Aaron. These are all people who are part of my team and I couldn't be successful without. So I may have great visions, but above and beyond that, um, I, I, I just I just can't I can't sit here and tell you guys I do everything. I'm just a good visionary. Um, I can work with my team and make things happen. I think really outside the box, but no man is an island, and I'm not. Do you have a dream car? I do, and it most likely would be an all-wheel drive version of that with all creature comforts. That would really be a dream car for me. How does this shifting mechanism work in the EV? As Josh Wonderbread, very easy. So, you notice that shifter. I have like a quake shifter that exists into the EV vehicle. Um, I have micro switches on the very bottom of that, and the micro switches have different positions. And with those micro switches, I send in a 12 volt signal. My controller has the capability of identifying a 12 volt signal for different parameters for neutral, for forward, and reverse. So when I initiate a gear, when I push, let's say, forward, it creates a contact between the 12 volt and the signal that goes to my controller to say, go forward. And the same with reverse. So by pushing forward or pulling backwards, I can initiate forward motion or reverse motion accordingly. So it gives you that feel of the EV being more enthusiast friendly than not. And that's how it works. So I hope that helps, Josh Wonderbread. How big is the K3V batteries, asking Vish Honda. You know what's so funny? I'm sitting in front of a beautiful factory 935 with twin turbos. I'm getting a bunch of EV questions. And then when I sit in front of the EV, I get a bunch of petrol questions. Anyway, um, it is 32 kilowatts is what I have on it. 32 kilowatt hours battery packs. I have a 16 in the front, 16 in the rear, set up in parallel. Are there any new Honda projects in the works? Um, apart from working on customers' cars, there's a Civic here and a CRX over there and an S2000 right in front of the Civic. Um, these are client projects. Coming from me in-house, it's up to American Honda. We talked to the upper management who's been working remotely uh, with American Honda almost weekly. And right now, there may be a project. It depends how budgets look after this pandemic or as the time progresses. So we'll find out, you know? Savage says, have you thought about doing reviews on your viewers' bills, like Hoonigan Build Bio Series? That would be interesting to watch you dissect people's bills. That's a good idea. I haven't thought of that. Maybe that's something I should think about. I'll talk to the team about that. Thanks for suggesting that. I have not. Because you know me. I'll get down to the technical details of the call. You know, that'd be good. How was it going to school in Long Beach, asked Williams. As you, many of you may know, um, I went to Cal State Long Beach. It was actually quite enjoyable. 
I had my CRX at the time as my daily driver, and I didn't need AC because it was nice and cool. But it's enjoyable, particularly because not only was I in engineering, I studied chemical engineering, and not many people studied that curriculum. So we had a very small class. My graduate class was, I think, 18 of us. And it was very intimate, and you had very good interaction with the lecturers. So I found it as a very strong basis for me to achieve what I'm doing today. Hello, Archer 911 Carrera. So Archer 911 Carrera, good to see you as well, is a gentleman who has a pulse chamber and he wants me to explain some of the attributes of the pulse chamber. So what I'm gonna do just for you, Archer, I'm gonna do a video later on today. I'll put it up on the Beast Motor YouTube feed. So if you haven't subscribed to our feed, guys, go on there, the link is in my bio here on Instagram. And you have the capability of being able to see what makes the pulse chamber tick and why it's so amazing. How does it work? and I'll be able to go through detail. I will give the proper scientific explanation and I'll also break it down so everyone could understand with analogies. So you don't have to be a scientist to understand how I make that thing work. What is the difference between a D16A1 and D16ZC? So it depends, Josh Wonderbread. The D16ZC exists in two configurations, single hand overhead cam and dual overhead cam. On a single overhead cam, of course, there's quite a few differences. If you look at the single cam ZC versus D16A1, the crankshafts were same in terms of stroke. The rods were similar in terms of length. I think it's 137 millimeters, but the thickness on the A1 was much thicker. Of course, the A1 is a twin cam um, configuration with a very interesting rock arm assembly, which doesn't lend itself very well to very high lifts and durations, while the A6 derived single cam one does. Now, when we compare the ZC twin cam to the A1 twin cam, they're identical in every facet with exception of the camshafts. The duration and center lines as they're set up on the JDM ZC twin cam is slightly more generous in terms of performance than the Z60A1, which was in the first gen Acura Integra with the pop-up headlights. Do you still talk with chemical engineering? Says DJM HWD. Yes, I do. Almost in everything I do. So for those of you who don't know what chemical engineers do, they take raw materials, design components to allow it to become useful products. And that's a very broad way of saying that. So what does that mean? You have to have a very strong knowledge in, of course, chemistry. You have to have a background in civil engineering because, of course, plants are built. You have to have an understanding of electrical engineering because you need to do process control with some of the things that you design. You need to have a very strong basis in mechanical engineering, obviously because fluids are mechanical devices, even though it may not sound like it. And above and beyond, you have to be able to transport and maintain that mass that comes from some of the fluids you're using. So I took as many electives as I could in mechanical, mechanical engineering because of that, because I had affinity for everything mechanical. So being that I'm a chemical engineer, it gave me a very strong background in many different facets of engineering. Of course, engineering economics is make busy drivers against this ITB Kevin. Um, so Kevin says that to me a lot. He's a good friend of mine and he wants me to race often. And what prevented me from racing is me being able to have this business. Um, there are people who rely on me for subsistence. Right now during COVID, things are very interesting in terms of a business and I have to continue to work hard. I'm here every day, literally spend time away from my family. I'm literally working every day and I'm doing that to take care of customers first and to make sure that they are okay because it's, it's, it's challenging. And racing is a way for me to really experience my creations. And with tracks closed now and me not having the flexibility of years ago when I worked for someone, I will never, I don't think I'll ever in the nearest future race as quick as much as I did before. I just don't have that luxury. Um, creativity, creation is more important to me at this time. Is there a better option for an OEM pressure tensioner with plastic which grooves from wear over time? Um, no, there's really nothing out there. But what I've noticed is that poor oils tend to exacerbate that. So I use pure oil and it must be the zinc content, but I don't see the wear that I've seen with conventional oils. So. Um, since you change yours and that plastic it can get brittle and break very easily, you need to protect it. So if I were you, I would post haste, start using pure all stuff. Because that's the only thing I've done that allows me to put that wear at bay. And I can put an engine after 70,000 miles and look at my um, chain tensioner guides and they look just as good. And that's with the factory tension on it. How crazy is that, eh? So on that note, guys, I must depart. I'm getting the warning now from my phone that it's going to cut me off. But I'll keep this here on for 24 hours on Instagram. I will then upload this on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed, go to my bio here on Instagram and subscribe with Vigor. And then you'll be able to get updates of my very whittled down but very precise 
Tech Tuesday archive moment. I'll also have this on your favorite podcasting networks. So, Spotify, um, Anchor, um, iHeartRadio, uh, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Podbean, all that fun stuff, it's there. And I'll put that there right now. So, thanks for being a great part of my family. I really appreciate you guys. Stay safe. And see you soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.